Hello, people of Earth. Welcome to my studio. I'm Nancy L.T. Hamilton. And in this video, I'm going to be giving you all the precursors to enable you to flesh that stones on your jewelry. So uh, this video is all the little details, uh, information that you're going to need to know to be able to complete this process successfully and hopefully how to avoid super big errors. Um, one of the things you need to know about this little rub over setting uh, or flush setting or a false gypsy, uh, there's a whole bunch of other names, is that this is really only for hard, durable stones. So you want something that's on the Mohs scale, uh, which measures hardness of things. You want something at 9 to 10 on the Mohs scale. So that usually entails diamonds, moissanite, sapphires, rubies, other uh, synthetic stones, cubit zirconia, things like that. You can try it with other stones. Just be prepared that it, there's a possibility it may crack or scratch. Hardened tool steel, I think it's somewhere like 7.5 on the Mohs scale. So if you've got a a seven on the Mohs scale stone in here. Chances are that this burnisher is going to scratch. Um, there's also a possibility it can scratch like the eight, depending on the steel. So you want to be really careful about what you're setting this way. If you've got some peridot or amethyst, this is not the way to do it. There's other types of stone settings, numerous types of stone settings that I'm not going to go into here, but just know that it's really important to know at the beginning. I recommend practicing with less expensive stones and cheap metal. Like I'm using, uh, what is this, 14 gauge copper and crown, a uh, crown cellar pack, uh, cubic, zir <laughs> cubic zirconia for practicing. And you can get bags of 100 for just a few bucks to practice with. I would try sizes from three to one and a half millimeters round because they're the easiest ones to set. The one millimeters, you're, it's getting harder and harder to get your little tip of your burnisher in there. And any bigger stones, there's so much, um, you need such a thick layer of metal to not have the culet stick out that it becomes labor, laborious and uh, at this point, the threes are just sticking out of the bottom of this, and it's pretty thick metal. There are ways you can go ahead and make this easier as far as uh, determining how thick a metal you're going to use. You don't have to be stuck with, oh, I can't find 14 gauge or I can't find 12 gauge. Um, you can always solder two 18s together. That'll give you a really thick. You can solder two 20s together. That'll give you a little less thickness. Uh, another option is to, you know, have your piece and add elements on top of it that create additional thickness. So you could set something like this up on top of your metal. Let's say it was a ring shank that was just a bit too thin. And you can solder these on and then drill through that and that'll give you added depth. So you don't, and there are many other ways you can do a jump ring underneath the setting. Uh, to add additional height. Um, there's a couple of other design ideas on my website regarding this, regarding thickening up, creating enough. Because you don't really want the, the culet sticking out. It's done. Uh, it's not considered the best practice, but it is done, especially for earrings and pendants. Um, bracelets, if they have enough openings and gap, let's say you're doing it on a domed bracelet, you'd probably be okay. But a ring for sure, especially if it's going to be a flat, band ring, uh, there's a tendency for the culet to scratch the heck out of your hands. So keep all these things in, in your mind when you're determining the thickness of your, the depth of your stone. For starting, you should check your stones with a loop to make sure that there aren't any cracks, inclusions, or flaws that could shatter under the pressure of setting. 
Anyway, the first thing you're going to want to do is make yourself a burnisher. Now, this is a broken drill bit, and they make really good burnishers because of their shape, that they're hardened steel, a lot of benefits, nice and narrow down here. This is great for a tiny little stone. So I'm going to briefly show you how I do it. There are other ways to shape this into what we want. If you're using a drill bit with a 3 32nd inch shank, it'll fit easily into your quick change. If not, you'll, using something larger like a finishing nail, you'll want to switch to the traditional chuck key hand piece. Or you can get one of these call it adapters to put into your 3 32nd inch quick change. Put on your mask, turn on your ventilation if you have any. I'm not going to because you won't be able to hear me. Uh, and what we're going to do, this is 220 sandpaper. I just bought some 150 that I'm going to start with. You could also use a hon honing stone, but I've got some 220. I'm going to start with that. It's wet dry, so I got it wet. That helps to keep the dust from clogging up inside the little granules so it lasts longer. So what I'm going to do is just working more at this angle. You see that? Kind of rounding and thinning that point a little. I'm also going to round this tip. Notice it's that my burr is not straight up and down. It's kind of around. Because I want a rounded point on here. I don't want it to scratch. I want it to burnish. And you can go, I'm going to take down this sharp edge between the conical shape here and the shaft shape here just to make it smoother and then bring this up and start curling it to the tip and bring it back down and that looks pretty good if you're working with a nail or something like that chances are you're going to have to grind a bigger cone initially and then blend it so we're going to switch sandpaper to a 320 once again, I'm blending this seam here between the two parts and also sanding the sides. I want to check that that isn't sharp. And then we're going to go to 600 or 4 and then 6 actually. You'll not want to use the sandpaper for anything besides steel. I just keep it in a special place. You don't want to mix steel with silver filings. It can contaminate your pickle and your refining. And you having this wet keeps this cool. If you get this overheated and it turns blue on the tip, you've probably annealed it, which is okay. And, but unless you do some tempering on it, um, which I'm not going to explain here. I have a video on making chasing a repose tools that covers this topic. If you don't do that, it'll be soft and annealed, so it won't, the point won't last as long. So it's not like it's terrible, but just not as efficient. Right, we're at six now, and you should not see any big scratches or lines. All right, here's my eight. So you can go up to a thousand if you want on this. I, I'm just not going to because I don't want to bore the heck out of you. And just rub some rouge. And then run this along the rouge. So you should have a nice shiny tip when you're done. This will be a really good burnisher for tiny stones like a 1.5. Nice and slim at the tip. You compare it to this one that I use for three millimeter stones. You can see what a big difference it is. Uh, oh, and there's one more I wanted to show you that you can use. So these are the GRS long and thin steel points, and they're great for making burnishers with. They also make, GRS also makes a short and thin version of this. And here's a finishing nail that easily can be turned into a burnisher. Cut off this end, and then you've already got the conical shape here at the tip. You can just smooth down these facets and blur the edge here, and you've got a nice finishing tool. Holders. So these mushroom handles are great. 
You can get in there with the, this in your palm like that. These, the long and thin burnishers, you probably don't need a handle on. They're probably long enough to hold. You really have to push hard. So whatever makes it more comfortable, thermoset, thermoset plastics work. You can even use polymer clay to make handles that you shape your fingers. You can also use the GRS quick change to hold your burnishers in. Whatever you need, darling. Get creative, that's your job as a jeweler. So the next thing we need to talk about is holders. How are you gonna hold your work? Uh, flat pieces, you probably can wedge it with your hand depending on how small the square is. It is much better though to have it in some kind of vise if you're doing something like this. Uh, but you can hold it. The setting process, the burnishing process, uh, you put so much pressure on it, there's a bit great potential for it to move. So. Anyway, I wanted to discuss some of the options. Um, one, of course, is the uh, GRS Benchmate. There's also a ring adapter attachment where you can put the adapter inside of the ring shank, which I thought I should probably show you. This comes out and then this part fits in. And then if, if I was good, I'd get up and find the right size plastic for this, but I'm not going to. So anyway, this you can tighten this down so that the ring doesn't move. So it's a nice system for holding rings. You don't have to have this. But as you saw, I had my ring uh, in the clamp and that was working fine for me. I set this little guy in there. So um, I'm going to show you a couple more ideas. Of course, these are in the pricey range. But if you do enough stone setting or work holding in general, it's a good thing to have. The uh, engraver's block or engraver's ball, I wish I had bought a million years ago. I can't believe I waited until last year to get one. It's awesome. Um, there's attachments for holding flat sheet, which you don't get with the Benchmate, unless there's some attachment I'm not aware of, which is probably the truth. Um, but you can also hold your rings in here. I use these leather doodahs for holding ring shanks. And I also have the drop down shelf, which is adjustable. This can go up or down depending where I need it to go. So that's nice. Once again, pricey. You can get knockoffs online and I have bought a couple for Chimera and they have worked really pretty well. I don't know how long they're going to last and they're not a smooth action. I mean, they're definitely cheap, but they're under $100. So that's a huge difference, especially with these blocks. So for me, this is a good size. For you, and if you're going to be doing a lot of engraving, the bigger, heavier ball might work. And this is my inexpensive version. Everything will probably cost you under $50. So this is the Peppy Tools uh, ring clamp, which is a pretty good clamp. It'd be great for holding rings. You're not going to be able to get pieces of metal like that in there. But anyway, it doesn't, it's a little too big. This can, this is a uh, Amazon really cheap, the, the clamp's a piece of crap, but I bought it for this. And then I just cut out a, this, a square and cut out the center to be able to hold this. So you can move, you have, do have some movement if you want to get around an edge. Um, it's a good inexpensive alternative to some of the much pricier pieces. And then last but not least is the universal vise from GRS. But there's all these attachments that fit in here. They're also, they also fit in to the engraver's block too, so you can hold rings or sheets. Um, I probably should sell this because I don't use it anymore since I got my engraver's block, but it's less expensive than the engraver's block, which is why I got it before. So anyway, for holding, those are some ideas. I'm sure there are others, but whatever works for you. 
So a couple of the next tools you could probably pull out are a pair of digital calipers, Sharpie, fine point or something, and a ruler. And make yourself a little sticky wax, which is a red sticky wax that you can buy. It's used in wax making. I mean, not wax making. <laughs> wax carving and model making for jewelry making. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you just basically need a stick and the wax and work it with your hands. After a while, that gets all dirty and changes color into this brown yuck. But, well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about stones and layout. The pointy end is the culet. The flat top part of your stone is the table. Table on profile there. I've got the tip, the culet buried in there. Um, so we're going to measure it two ways. We're going to measure across and we're going to measure up and down. We want to make sure that our metal is thick enough to be able to handle the depth of the stone. Next thing is if you don't have a microscope, a loop is really, really nice. This multiplies it by 10 times. So when you go in to look to see if your stone, how the inside of your stone looks, or you want to look at your stone for cracks or occlusions, a loop is really nice to have. And the other thing you're going to need is burrs. This is a kit I set up for my classes, and it includes the three uh, settings I'm going to show you in this video, in the next video, in part two. So you'll have the setting burr setting, you'll have a heart burr setting, and a ball burr setting. Anyway, those are some things you'll need down the road. You'll need some lubrication. Love the blade butter from Pepe Tools. And you'll need your wax stick. And if you're doing a lot of different size settings, it really helps to have a little burr box like this with the size of your burrs labeled on it. These are like two, three dollars a piece, depending on where you get them from. And this, my students and myself find them invaluable when trying to find the right burr. Another option is to use a magnet and lay the burrs that you're going to use on it in order so that you know which comes next. Moving on. Now we're going to talk about measuring our stone. To know what thickness of metal you'll need so that your culet doesn't stick out the bottom, You'll want to, and this is how I do it, I don't know how anybody else does it, but I like to put the stone flat table down, push it into the tip of the wax stick. So now that it, it's sitting with the table and uh, culet up, and then I grab my handy dandy zeroed out digital calipers, and then pull off my wax stick, make sure that it is actually sitting table down, it's not angled or anything like that. So we have our depth of the metal at 1.92. So that will be pretty much our minimum thickness. And then this is going back on its table. Now we're going to measure the uh, girdle width to see what size our stone is. Um, move this and I'll show you something. If I put my calipers like this to pick up the stone, there's this gap here, which is about this depth of the stone so I wouldn't be able to grab it but if you put it on a block table down and come in with the calipers flat against the block and then squeeze it shut you can pick it up easier so this is a three millimeter stone so a 2.99 is pretty much right on for that so that's how you measure your stone pretty easy So I'm going to do a three stone layout. So we're going to have one stone here, one stone here, one stone here. So if I was doing two stones close together like this, I would like to have a minimum of 0.5 millimeter between these two edges like that. So let's say this is a three millimeter stone and this is a three millimeter stone. I'll divide it in half. I've snuck the math in on you. You see that? Sneaky woman. So now I've got 
two, one and a half, one and a half, one and a half, and then 0. 0.5. So we've got 3.5. I would mark these out on center using my dividers. So this is to set out my next stone. I would put that in there. I would set these 3.5. So, and then I leave that ah, right off the top there. Leave that in the middle and then walk this over. And that's my next center. So my next stone would go there. And that would allow for the 0.5 between the two and the three millimeter distance. So you could go all along a band by doing, you know, that. And you could scratch a little scribe mark in with the dividers. So I've set, already set these because it's too difficult to do in the air. But what you really want to see is one leg of the dividers on the outside of the line and the other one on the, this is just a hair over three. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millimeters. And then the way to test it is to drag your dividers over your metal from one side, see that? And then drag from the other side. If we end up with a single line, that means that the cal that it's exact center on here. If you end up with double lines, you need to adjust your dividers a little bit more. So then the layout for the stone starts on this line. I put the ring on the ring mandrel for dapping a little center, and I'm going to lay my punch at an angle to make sure that I come in at the right locale. This is an automatic centering punch that no longer functions. So now we have our little center divot that we can use to walk our dividers around. I forgot to mention that um, the reason we're putting this on the mandrel is so when we tap it, it doesn't crush. Uh, this is a slightly thin brass practice band. Uh, if you have a heavy duty one, you don't have to worry about it taking it off. You can just tap, dap it in your vise. So now that we have our mark and we've got our calipers set, so we're going to come over and drag our calipers, creating a little mark there. And there's another one there. So those are my three marks I'm going to use. Because remember, I'm only doing three stones. And there. There they are. OK? It's more accurate than with a ruler. Well, that's the end of the video. I think I've gotten everything out of my head for this part of it. This is more of the get ready prep video. Uh, the second video will actually have the three different setting styles for uh, the flush setting. So you should definitely watch that. Best of luck to you and uh, I'll see you for the next video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Ciao.